we want to say welcome if you're out in Facebook world and we're going to be getting into our discipleship training course here just shortly. So uh, uh, settle in and uh, oh shoot, I did not put the notes online. Tony, you got to put the notes online. There, we're there in just a second. Hang on. I will be back. Okay, for all you people out in Facebook world, there should be notes now on uh, on the church's Facebook page. So, and just a little FYI, there are two pages tonight. So, um, got really industrious this week. So, anywho, all right, I think we are ready to start. Are you guys ready to start? Okay, good. Good to see you all. Good that we can be together. Why don't we pray? We have a lot of ground to cover tonight, and. Uh, should be good. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're so grateful tonight that we can uh, gather in your name. We're thankful for the call that you've, uh, you have sent out that we have, we've heard and we want, to, uh, we want to prepare ourselves for, to be your disciples and to be disciple makers. We want to uh, be faithful to the, the call, the command that you have given to us. And as we continually are trying to better understand how this works, I pray that you would just, uh, something would happen tonight that would just click with us, that that we would get this and, and uh, make just a little bit more sense as we move forward. Bless us as we do this. Bless those that are watching at home and, uh, and uh, are learning that way. Please use this time well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, you do have two pages tonight, right? And so I would invite you to take out the uh, the uh, one that says Lesson 3, Transformed by the Renewal of the Mind, Part 5. That's going to be the one we look at first. And the reason there are two sheets tonight is is really for no other reason than I wanted to make sure that you had access to the scriptures that we're going to be looking at closely tonight. You know, a lot of times in this training course, we've been, we've been focusing on what our author has been teaching us from the book, which has been kind of a combination of, of uh, scripture references and, and kind of building, you know, some thought, philosophy, and that sort of thing. Tonight, what we're going to be looking at is... Uh, pretty much purely scripture and there are several sections of it that we're going to be looking at and the reason we're doing this is because in the book what he does with sections five six and seven which i didn't get to we're going to do section seven of chapter five i know that sounds confusing section seven of chapter five will be next week okay 
We're going to be looking at section 5 and 6 of chapter 5. Um, and one of those, the first one, has to do with one particular book that Paul wrote. And the second one has to do with an, another book. And the point is, in all of this, is to start and uh, figure out how this kind of overarching philosophy and theology and all of these things that he's been teaching us actually uh, show up in the scriptures so that you can see, uh, for example, we're going to be looking at Paul. What Paul does is he takes these, these thoughts, it's actually backwards, what our author did is he studied Paul and noticed the pattern this pattern that was present in all of these different books and what we've been studying is the pattern and now what we're going to do tonight and next week is look at the scriptures specifically to see how the pattern that's been presented to us actually works in the scripture I hope that makes sense okay so to that end uh, let's look at uh, that first sheet and Part five has to do with concepts then of being transformed, developed by Paul in Colossians. We're going to be looking at the book of Colossians. Now, one of the things that, uh, good evening, one of the things that I would uh, encourage you in, here you go, John. there's a couple of sets for each of you. Uh, let's, before we get into this, let's, can we talk? Can we talk uh, preacher to parishioner? Can we talk? Okay. I need to ask you a couple of questions. Do you have a good Bible that you use? Okay. There's that qualifier. <laughs> okay. I know, know a lot of us have good Bibles, but, but I'm, I'm particularly concerned with do you have a Bible that's kind of your go-to Bible? Okay. And the reason I'm asking you this is, I mean, in particularly like what we're dealing with tonight, you're not going to be carrying stuff like this around, okay? This is not very handy to carry around, is it? But there are, uh, that's, that's why, though, the more familiar you are with the Bible, then carrying a Bible with you will be you know, such a, such, a, such a thing that you will be able to do and want to do because you'll be able to reference it. it uh, carrying a Bible around is pretty easy. In fact, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but you're probably carrying a Bible around right with you right now, and you're just not aware of it. There are lots of resources online for free. Hundreds of different translations of the Bible are there uh, that... Of course, the only thing is you have to, you actually have to use it. But that's the same problem you have with the Bible. You actually have to use it. So the, the significance of, of that is that we, we need to get familiar with uh, not only the, the various things that the Bible is teaching, but uh, if, if we can get familiar with, with where things are, uh, because... Uh, have, well, let me just give you an example. Uh, I, I know that, that uh, Brother Jim is a beloved preacher in this church, right? Very much so. Okay. And y'all have made me feel beloved, so that's, that's very nice too. Okay, so we have two beloved preachers, but are, are Brother Jim and I the same? No, we're not. Okay. And, and that's the way it is with the Bible writers. Not that we're Bible writers, but... But people have different, different styles, different emphasis, different ways of thinking, different ways of putting things down, and so forth. And uh, what we're going to be studying tonight and next week are Paul, are really Paul's kind of thinking, the way he thinks. And there's a tremendous consistency in the books that he's writing, but I don't know whether we get that or not. So anyway, hopefully we'll get that a little bit tonight. So in the book of Colossians... And the first sheet that you have, the first sheet, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, the section of Scripture from, first, or from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. Now, uh, 
as we get into this, remember that there's a pattern that we've been learning, that there is an expectation that a, a disciple of Jesus is going to be working through a process that is going to make them able to, uh, by the Spirit's direction and by the fact that they've trained their minds, their hearts, their wills with certain habits and so forth, they are going to be able to respond to a wide variety of situations uh, that they might face as a follower of Jesus. That's really, that's the teleos, that's the goal that we've been striving for. That's the perfection, the completion that we started talking about when we started talking about. That's what it looks like. Now, what we're going to be exploring are some of the ways that Paul you know, articulates how that actually happens. So let's look at the first one. Uh, again, Colossians 1, 9 to 13. For this reason, from the day we heard it, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking God to fill you with the knowledge of what he wants in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This will mean, this will mean, here's what that means, that you will be able to Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. And so give him, the Lord that is, real delight. As you bear fruit in every good work and grow up in the knowledge of God. I pray that you'll be given all possible strength according to the power of his glory. So that you'll have complete patience and become truly steadfast and joyful. And I pray that you will learn to give thanks to the Father who has made you fit, has made you fit to share the inheritance of God's holy ones in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Now, what you'll notice here is in, in this section that I just read, he starts out by saying to the Colossians, I'm praying for you. And then he goes into some of the specific things that he's praying. For example, wisdom and spiritual understanding. That could also be, it is also described as knowledge. So what Paul is praying is that you will uh, gain knowledge, that you will become spiritually wise. But here's the thing, to what end? What is the point of that? And that's what he says. He says, uh, we're, asking you to, we're asking God to fill you with knowledge of what he wants in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This will mean, in other words, this is what's going to happen if, you, if he answers our prayer and he does this within you, you are going to be able to do something you're going to be able to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. Oh, and by the way, that is going to bring great delight to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but that's something that should, should resonate with us. We should want to bring, you know, delight to the Lord. How do we do that? It starts by having a good understanding of knowledge, of spiritual wisdom, that has been developed and translated, hear this, get this, because this is the pattern, that it isn't, just, it isn't just that I get this information. This information has to be distilled, it has to be processed, it has to be worked through within our minds. Thinking, we have to think about it. And in response to it, then it's going to translate into behavior, our conduct, will become that which brings delight to the Lord. Okay, so how does it start? How do we start being able to, to live as the people of God, to live as his disciples? It starts with knowledge, understanding, wisdom, that then is, goes through a process. It is this process, this distilling, this thinking, this working through it, that is what we are focusing on. And this is brought up for two reasons. First of all, this is challenging the notion of some that the way that God works in the world is to just somehow, you know, uh, 
bam, I just have it and now I'm spiritual. Okay? I, one of the things that, that I deal with all the time, well, not all the time, because I don't find myself in circles of people who have this thought too often, but uh, I've, had, I've had people as, uh, you know, and just talking with brothers and sisters in Christ and they know I'm a preacher and they, thought, well, what does a preacher do? I get that a lot. People, people are very curious about what preachers do. And I would say, why don't you come follow me for a while and then you'll know what I do. But whatever. And, and part of what I say is, well, I spend quite a bit of time uh, in study and in preparation for the, the presentations that, that I need to give. And, you know, for me right now, that would be uh, Sunday morning. You know, I do a Sunday school class. It takes time to prepare that. Uh, I do a, a, you know, sermon that takes time to prepare that. And then, of course, this material, it takes time to do that. And uh, uh, when, you, when you stop and add it up, it, it doesn't take long to, to fill quite a bit of time. And I, I remember every once in a while I have somebody come up to me and go, well, why, what do you do that for? I mean, you don't need to do that. I mean, what do you don't need to do that? How would you do it? Well, just... Just uh, just stand up and say whatever God tells you to say. I would not want to listen to that. I, I would, <laughs> okay, because that's not how God works. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't, you know, I've, I've been, you know, preaching messages and I've felt inclined to kind of steer off in a direction every once in a while that I feel like maybe the Holy Spirit was leading me, okay, but that's a far cry from, from getting up on Sunday morning and saying, Hey, Lord, what are we going to talk about today? That's not how it works. Okay? And uh, that's not how it works with you either. It takes, it takes preparation. It takes time. It takes diligence. It takes work. And that's why oftentimes it doesn't happen. Is because one of those components is missing. And, uh, and so that's what, why we're emphasizing this so much. Uh, the, the, it starts, listen, it starts with having the correct understanding of God, which is then, if you'll go down to the next section that we've highlighted in your notes, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Now, uh, Colossians 1, 15 to 20 is about the most uh, concise uh, definition of, uh, of a theology of who Jesus is, as you'll find in a single passage of Scripture. This, there's a couple of paragraphs here, basically. And uh, this, is a, this is a section of Scripture that you would be wise to just take and analyze in your mind phrase by phrase. What does this mean? He is the image of God, the invisible one, the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? What, what, what exactly does that mean? And that's a part of, of coming to the place where, uh, where we know, you know, we, where, where our knowledge actually is, is a little deeper. Verse 16, this is, I'll tell you what, th think about this next verse all day long, and it'll give you plenty to think about. For in him, talking about Jesus, all things were created in the heavens and here on earth, things we can see and things we cannot, thrones and lordships and rulers and powers. All things were created both through him and for him. Think about, think about what that means. Just, again, get a theology. Don't let that word scare you. Theology simply means the study of God, the understanding of God. That's all it means. That's what we're trying to do, to, to have a knowledge of God. You already know quite a bit about God, don't you? Wouldn't you say? I, I, I bet you know quite a bit about God. But, there's, but, but drilling down and, and, and thinking about some of these things a little deeper would be greatly, uh, greatly helpful. Verse 18 of that passage he, he and he himself is supreme, the head over the body, the church. Well, we know the church, don't we? 
We know a local expression of the church. We, that's our congregation, isn't it? But we also know that the church is the body of Christ, the one body of Christ that's made up of, of followers of Jesus around the world, all over the world. And who is the head of it? It's Jesus. Jesus is. Okay. He, he is the start of it all, firstborn from the realms of the dead. What's that mean? He was resurrected. No one had ever been resurrected Beside, before Jesus, okay, you might say, wait a minute, what about Lazarus? Okay, not the same thing. Lazarus, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he died again. Jesus rose from the dead, and he, when he was risen from the dead, the scriptures make it very clear that he had a different kind of body, a different kind of presence, and so forth, that was not anything like what Lazarus was. I'm not discounting Lazarus. Lazarus was a cool guy, okay? But Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the bodily resurrection of Jesus is the beginning point. That's what Paul is saying in Colossians. And so we need to, to understand, uh, beginning of what? The beginning of everything now. Everything that we're meeting about tonight began with the resurrection of Jesus. That was such a shocking event. It is still such a shocking event. Uh, but 19, for in him all the fullness was glad to dwell and through him to reconcile all to himself, making peace through making peace through the blood of his cross. Remember we talked about peace Sunday, how God made peace. God, there's the peace that God made. That's what we're talking about here through Jesus on the cross. Through him, yes, things on earth, on the earth, and also the things in the the heavens. This reconciliation is taking place. And who is the centerpiece of it? Jesus. We need to, we need to develop a very strong understanding of Jesus. Okay? We need to go deeper into things. Like, I mean, we, we need to know things that are, th these are not unimportant things. Like, we need to know that his mother was Mary, right? We need to know that uh, he was born both of God and man. You know, the spirit was his father, so to speak. He was born in Bethlehem. These are all things that we know about Jesus, right? But do you see, hopefully, that there's a difference between being able to give, you know, basic geographical or bi biographical information about Jesus and some of these deeper theological things that are true about Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. That's where we need to, to, to go to that, that place. And the payoff, listen, the payoff for doing that, is that going to be an easy thing to do? Not necessarily, because you're going to have to do one of the hardest things in the world nowadays to do. You're going to have to stop doing something else, and you're going to have to think on it. And that's not something that a lot of people are doing today. Okay, There's not an app for that. Okay, you're going to you're going to have to, you know, think about it and, and let your mind let this wash over your mind and and consider what does that mean and, and start putting some things together like what we're doing here. So uh, the, the point that I want you to see uh, then is as we go on to the next one. Now, this was notice here how. The, the book begins. It begins by a prayer saying, this is what I would, I would like. I'd like. I'm asking God to, to make you uh, essentially wiser and to have more knowledge and so forth so that you'll be able to live in such a way that is proper and pleasing to God. Okay, well, that sounds okay. Now, and then we, we get that section on Jesus. We get to understand him a little bit more about God. Now, jump over to chapter 3, because it's in chapter 3, which is the next section of Scripture in your notes. He then reminds us of the various steps along the way to instruct us, as well as to comfort us in the journey. Look, look at this. So chapter 3 starts out this way. So if you were raised to life with the king... Search for the things that are above, where the king is seated at God's right hand. Think about the things that are above, 
not the things that belong on the earth. Don't see, don't you see, you died. And your life has been hidden with the king in God. When the king is revealed, and he is your life, remember, then you too will be revealed with him in glory. Okay, so we transition now from, from where he was started this letter to then by making an assumption. So if you were raised to life with the king. Okay, question. When does one become raised to new li raised to life with the king? When does that happen? Pardon me. It happens when when we're baptized. It happens when we, which which baptism is a, a piece of this idea of saying yes to him. I believe that you are Messiah, and I am committing my life to follow you. I become a Christ follower. That's essentially what it means. And yes, uh, the, the, uh, the picture that we see in baptism is one that is, is very much, you know, the picture of dying within the water and then being raised to walk in the newness of life. That's the picture. Okay, good. You see that. So the question is, how many of you, I, I expect everybody, but how many of you have already had that as an experience within your life? Okay, so if you were raised, who's that talking about? Is that talking about you? That's talking about me. Say that. That's talking about me. It's talking about me. It's talking about you. We were raised to life with the king. Search. Search for the things that are above, where the king is seated at the right, at God's right hand. Now, search is another way of thinking where he's going back to what he was praying for them. Searching for this is like seeking understanding, seeking wisdom, seeking knowledge. Okay, search. He's just saying that instead of, of having your eyes focused down here, they need to be focused up. Not, and, and the reason that our eyes are focused on heaven is why? Why does he say our eyes should be focused on heaven? Something is there. What? Who is there? Yeah, look what he says. Where the king is seated at God's right hand. The reason we're to focus our thinking above is because that's where Jesus is. That's where he is. Okay? And if, if what we're striving to do is to be like him... It makes sense. That makes sense. Does that make sense? That that's where we would focus our attention. Yeah, but we're going to live in this world. Shouldn't we be focusing on what's going on down here? Only after you have done a good job, an adequate job of preparing your mind to be able to see things down here now as they really are instead of how we have been, because we're so saturated with the culture, see things. See, we need to... Uh, we need to get our minds, you know, we, we can't be, you know, sucked up and, 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 you know, that's not how it works. We have to be the transformative agents in this world. But how do you do that? You have to be connected to, to something else and then live differently. Transformative agents don't live the same way as people who we're hoping to transform. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different thing. The problem, let me just say it very candidly. And, you know, if you're wearing soft shoes, you might want to pull them in just a little bit here. But the problem is so many of us, I'll get in that line a lot of times, are still more focused on, on being a cultural person than we are being a, a heavenly, heavenly minded person or a person of the kingdom. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem because instead of, you know, we'll give a casual look every once in a while you know, to where Jesus is and so forth, but mainly, you know, we're focused right down here. This is where, this is where we're focused. Okay? How am I going to stop doing that? I'll tell you how. By having a proper understanding of who God is and why this is so important. When you finally come to that place, you will find it much easier to keep your mind where it's supposed to be. 
But there's going to be a constant battle, waging back and forth, waging back and forth. And sometimes you'll be successful and sometimes you, you get your rear end kicked. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Okay? So it's, it's, but that's, that's what's going on here. Now, so uh, verses 1 and 4 basically says this is who you now are in Christ since this has taken place. Since. Now, look at verses uh, then. Uh, let's go on to the next section. Verses 5 through 17. And I'm not going to read all of this, but... Uh, again, that's why you have the notes. You can go back and, and kind of read, but, but I want you to notice then some of the highlights. Notice the first part of this, so then. So then. What does that mean, so then? What? What's next? This is what's next. See? Something happens. Something starts. The, you know, first of all, realize who you are. Get your mind figured out where it's supposed to be. So then what's supposed to happen next will happen next. What's supposed to happen next? Well, let's look. So then you must kill off the parts of you that belong to the earth. Kill them off. What? Illicit sexual behavior, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is a form of idolatry. It's because of these things that God's wrath comes on the children of disobedience. You two used to behave like that once. When did you behave like that once? When? Before you decided to become a Christ follower. Okay? But that's all past now. We're new. Okay. Uh, when your life consisted of that sort of thing. Verse 8. But now you must put a... Put away the lot of them. Anger, rage, wickedness, blasphemy, dirty talk coming out of your mouth. Don't tell lies to each other. All this, all this are, are these are behaviors, aren't they? Speech, the way we speak. What uh, illicit sexual behavior, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, greed, those are behaviors. Okay? And uh, anger, rage, wickedness, blasphemy, dirty talk, lies. Behavior. This behavior should be changing as a result of what you discovered about God. That's where it starts. Okay? Uh, any of you ever talk dirty? Has that ever been a problem for anybody? Just me. Okay? Wow. I did. Amen. I see that sign. Boy, if you was in an auction, you'd have bought it, brother. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, actually, actually, uh, foul language is one of those things that really uh, kind of I, I struggle with as a, as a young Christian, especially. I'll tell you why. Because I grew up in a church where everybody went to church and nobody said any bad words. But then I went home, and now my dad was a heck of a nice guy, wonderful guy, right? And, uh, and, you know, took his place amongst the leadership in the church. He was a deacon for a while, then he was an elder. And uh, I tell you what, Dad, Dad could throw down a few words too. And that was confusing for me. Because I, I, I thought, the lesson I took from that was that it was okay to say that if you aren't in church. But for that hour or two hours, or whenever you're around those church people, that's not right. Now, my mom had a different standard. If she caught me saying that, it was soap time. I mean, and she wasn't afraid to use it. She would wash my mouth out with soap. And she would get pretty mad at Dad if he was, you know. But finally, finally, the good news is, and that's the reason why this is a good story, is because Dad finally got over that, and he stopped doing that. And, but see... And I don't know if that's a problem for you or not. If it's a problem for you, it needs to stop. Okay? You need to stop talking like that. Why? Because those are words that are associated with the world. Those are not words that are associated with the people of God or the things of God. It's, it's just time to stop. Okay? Now, how do you do that? Well, uh, 
I can tell you for me, the way I stopped doing that, see, and I start picking up those words too. And, you know, the problem is uh, if you're not careful, you'll say those things in times when you don't realize somebody's around that shouldn't be around, you know. Uh, I just had to, I had to learn, you know, the, the hard way. It took, it, took, it took time. It didn't just happen overnight. But it started by, it's, I'll tell you where it started. <laughs> it started in two ways. First of all, I knew I was going to get in trouble if I ever did it again, Okay. I was gonna. I was gonna hear from from my mom and, and dad. Yeah, dad, that was hard hearing it from you because you're doing it too. Anyway, but that just makes it harder. But but the other side of it is besides knowing that there's a punishment there. Okay, it was the more I understood why that this was not what I was supposed to be doing. It made sense to me, and it I just felt ridiculous, you know, saying those things, and so. I'm just telling you that if you have a problem with it, uh, I can relate to that, okay? But but if you need to get through that, if you haven't figured out a way to get past that, then I can help you with that. Uh, but I, there's no secret formula. There's no bam and it's going to end. I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's just the same way I did. You're going to start thinking differently. Thinking, 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 thinking is huge. Huge. Okay. Uh, but notice then, he, he says it another way. I love this. This kind of goes along with the, the imagery of baptism. Verse 12, there are clothes you must put on then since God has chosen you, made you holy, and lavished his love upon you. Uh, the reason that made me think of that is because uh, one of the ways that he describes uh, Paul describes our relation, we're coming to Christ, is that we, we put off the old and we put on the new. You know? So we have, we have new clothes that we need to wear. Okay? You don't put new clothes on over old clothes. You, you don't put new clothes on if you're dirty, right? You take a bath and then you put new clothes on. Okay? We, we need to wear new clothes. Let's put on new clothes. Uh, and what are those clothes? Well, here they are. Verse 12, uh, the last part. You must, you must be tenderhearted, kind, humble, meek, and ready to put up with anything. Ready to put up with anything. That's, those are our clothes. You must bear with one another. For bonus points, if you can tell me what another word for bearing with one another is, I will give you a nickel. Think about that. What's that? Well, that, yeah, I'm thinking, well, I, I, I'll tell you what, save it, because uh, talking about it in my sermon on Sunday. Hmm. Okay. Uh, on top, whoa, on top of all of that, if that wasn't enough, you know what the cherry on the ice on the Sunday is? On top of that, verse 14, you must put on love which ties everything together and makes it complete. Let the king's peace be the deciding factor. Are you picking up some words here? Love and peace and, and uh, you know, what's that? Fruit of the Spirit. He's, he's saying them, but he's not saying them the same way. He's, Paul, Paul's a good, pre he's a good preacher because he's packaged his message into different places, different churches, and it doesn't even, sometimes it doesn't even sound like the same, but it's basically the same message over and over again. Yeah. Verse 16. Now this is critical because this is a key formula to being able to, uh, to move into deeper places in your walk with God. Let the king's word dwell richly among you. What's the king's word? The Bible. As you teach and exhort. What is exhort? Yeah. Lift, yeah. Uh, one of the words that I, I like the word exhort uh, because sometimes we struggle trying to define the difference between teaching and preaching. Teaching. Uh, is less about exhortation as much as it is 
uh, instruction, he, one, two, three, four, five. These are the steps to do one, two, three, you know, and you build upon that. Exhortation. Sermons are different, I think. Sermons, I, I mean, if, if there wasn't supposed to be a difference between teaching and preaching, we'd use the same word in the scripture for the same. Preaching has to do with not only taking scripture, but it is proclaiming it in a way that, uh, that, that I think challenges and exhorts. It, it encourages, it uh, hopefully inspires, you know, people to something, whatever it is that, uh, that we're talking about. But it happens, get this, it happens uh, through the word, through the teaching and exhorting one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God with grateful hearts. And whatever you do in word or action, do everything in the name of the Master Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, what is, what, is all of, what is the point of all this? Okay, you can read Colossians on your own, but the bottom line, look at the bottom line. It is important to see that what we have been developing over the last several months is the central theme and not either a one-off or a weird new way or method. The thing that I want to make sure you understand as we study this book, and the reason I chose this book is not because it's just some you know, new thing that's out. It actually is a, a wonderful understanding of the, of the process of putting all of that together. And what I need you to understand is that what we're talking about is not anything that is new or weird or you know anything like that. It is actually what the, how the Bible presents uh, the way that this process of maturity is supposed to work. And... Uh, so I, I need you to see that. So does that, does that kind of make sense? It starts with knowledge, and then as knowledge, as knowledge filters down, as wisdom filters down, it begins to show up in behavior. Okay? So if you were me, and you were trying to help people to become stronger in their walk with Jesus, which would you emphasize first? getting them to do certain behaviors or getting them to think in a different way. Think in a different way. Right. Because, listen, I know lots of Christian people who can, who can imitate Christian behavior, right? That's what I was doing on Sunday mornings when I wasn't saying those bad words. I was imitating Christian behavior, okay? But it wasn't until I went back and thought differently about things that I stop doing it. Okay? We, d disciples are people who have come through that way. Does that make sense to you? Okay? And if, if it doesn't quite yet, I understand that. Uh, let's go on to the next page. Uh, the Part six then has to do with concepts of being transformed, developed by Paul in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on this primarily because I preached through the book of Ephesians not too long ago, and I know you guys remember everything I said about that, so probably isn't necessary. Um, but th there are what, I, what I'd like for you to see, though, is this pattern. That's, that's really the thing that we're emphasizing is the pattern. Notice this, verse then, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 17 to 19. How does it start? I pray. So he's starting out with prayer again. I pray that the God... Of King Jesus our Lord, the Father of glory, would give you in your spirit the gift of being wise. There it is, right? And seeing things people can't normally see. Understanding, wisdom. Because you are coming to know him. See, that's where it starts. As we know him, these are going to be some of the things that happen. And have the eyes of your inmost self opened to God's light. And what's the payoff? Then, what's next? Then you will know exactly what the hope is that goes with God's call. And, or, and you will know the wealth of the glory of his inheritance in his holy people. And you will know 
the outstanding greatness of his power towards us who are loyal to him in faith according to the working of his strength and power. Knowing. See that? Starts out exactly the same way. Starts out in a different, different words, different, a little bit different emphasis, but essentially starting out exactly the same way. And uh, he prays for them and uh, uh, to develop a point of loyalty to God and, and also to understand the wealth of our inheritance. See, that's something to think about. It, you know, going back to that Colossians passage, if in fact, uh, you know, we are some of the, we are a co-heir with him, uh, we need to dwell on some of the, the things that are, are going to become ours because of that connection that we have with him. That's something to think about. That's a, motiv that's a great motivator. And, and realizing that there's a lot of things that we have in Christ right now that, that we're not really thinking about or you know, fully appreciating. And to that end, we're suffering in our walk with him because of it. Anyway, so again, and then the next section going on, uh, this is, uh, where are we? We're going to jump to chapter 4. Okay, you might say, why are you going to jump to chapter 4? Well, if you remember, when we studied Ephesians, the principal issue that Paul was dealing with the Ephesians is that he was trying to help a group of, of uh, Gentile Christ followers, people who were not Jewish first, but were Gentiles, and they, were, they had been made to feel less than full-fledged followers of Jesus. So actually what he does is he spends chapter 2 and 3 of Ephesians getting that sorted out for them so that in chapter 4, which is where we're going to pick up now, we can see, okay, now that, now that you are understand that you're a bona fide follower of Jesus, next, what's next? So then, what's next? This is my appeal to you. Yes, it's me, the prisoner in the Lord. You must live up to the calling you received. See that? Once you understand the calling, then you must understand the responsibility to live up to that calling. There's a standard of living that is radically different from where you were to where you are now. You must live up to that. And then he goes on to describe it. Bear with one another in love. Be humble. This should sound familiar. Meek and patient in every way with one another. Make every effort to guard the unity that the Spirit gives with your lives bound together in peace. There's one body and one Spirit. You, you were, after all, called to one hope which goes with your call. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us, and, and so on. Now, the, what's significant here is that there's this crazy idea that Paul has that once you've come into contact with the teachings and the, the principles, the power, the knowledge, the wisdom of God, that it is going to affect everything you do going forward. And uh, that's, that's the thought. I'm not sure we, you know, we, we still wrestle with that. So what do you do? If I'm still wrestling that, what do I need to do? Well, you need to go back and figure out what's missing in your thinking. Because something's missing. And, um, you know, if, if, we're having, if we're having difficulty submitting and, and following his logic that the next thing to do is, and doing those things becomes difficult, that's not to say that it's not going to be difficult. But there's, there's one, you know, it's one thing to say that something is difficult and another thing to say, I can't do it. And that's, that's where we need to, to, to figure out. If we're at a place where we say, I can't do that, I, I, I just can't do that, that tells me we need to go back and do some thinking because something's wrong. Something is off. Because, um, you know, if I can't love that person, if I, can't, if I can't, you know, be kind, if I, okay, are you saying it's hard? Yeah, it's hard. Okay, we live in a crummy world, don't we? And it's real easy to not be kind. And it's real easy to not love, okay? But if it, it is doable, it is doable 
and it is fixable, but it starts with understanding that, okay, now that I am this new person, this is what these new people do. And instead of trying to get all the other people to, to conform to whatever I want them to do, no, why don't we all just conform to what Jesus says? This is what the people do. That's the struggle going on in the church today, in a nutshell. We want to argue with Jesus about how we're supposed to live. That's, that's what's going on in a, in a lot of places. But I want you to notice with me uh, uh, in this section, da, 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 oh, yeah. He, he goes into a different track, which is starting in verse 11. Jump down there. It's, it's the, the verse 11. See that new paragraph? So these were the gifts that he gave. Some were apostles, others prophets, others evangelists, and others pastors and teachers. Okay, stop right there. Put your notes down. Look at me. What is the principal function of a prophet, pastor, preacher, teacher in the body of Christ? What is their first, what's job one? What do you think? What's that? Okay, that's a, I understand why you said, that's, yes, it has to be done with love. But there is, that's a, that's kind of a quality that all of us need to have. But these people who he's put in positions of leadership, what is, what's job, what is, what is it that they do? Lead others to Christ. Okay. That's not the, that's not the first job. Okay, it's we're, the, the, uh, what we're talking about. There is a single word to describe kind of all of these various things. What did you say? Oh, you cheater. <laughs> Turn around and say, you're a cheater. Okay, no, yeah, equip. Job one is equip. What does that mean, equip? Give you the tools to be able to, in other words, that's kind of what we're doing here, right? Equipping. Yes. Now, how, does, how do these people do it? Some, well, some do it through teaching. Some do it through preaching. Some th do it, uh, you know, in all kinds of ways. Living among people, you know, uh, having special focuses here and there and, and whatnot. Um, but the real job one of, uh, you know, people like myself, people say, what do, what do you do? Pe you know, people like to call me all kinds of things, and most of them are pretty nice. But, you know, uh, you're, the, you're the preacher. Yes, I do preach, but I do a lot of, I would say that, that my job above everything else is to be an equipper. Preaching is one of the ways that I help equip people. But uh, I consider my job to be, uh, I consider success to be in my job as uh, indicated by the number of people who are within the scope of my influence who are fully formed and functioning within the body of Christ. That's, that's success. And teaching and preaching and counseling and, you know, visiting and cajoling and, you know, whatever. All of that's all of those are little pieces of it. Part of it is, you know, you know, saying to people, you know, I believe you can do this, you, you know, and and giving them the skill set, showing them, you know, and and helping them. But equipping, equipping is, and where do we get that? Well, it's in, it's right there, isn't it? Their job is to give God's people the equipment they need. For the work of service and so to build up the king's body isn't that cool that's that's job one to equip god's people so uh you know on the uh, when i'm standing before the lord one of the things he's going to ask me is he's not going to ask me you know typical stuff that we might think but uh hey tony how many people did you disciple how many people did you empower in ministry to get involved and to find their way and, and teach them to equip others? 
that's that's what and by the way that's what he's going to be asking all of us I think is is to be accountable in in those kinds of things so um, again the the point of all of this is that uh, it starts in our minds and as we choose to follow him that wisdom that knowledge is going to translate into behavior and you know looking different uh, verse 17 jump on down to the next paragraph so this is what I want to say I am bearing witness to it in the Lord you must no longer behave like the Gentiles foolish minded as they are why verse 18 their understanding is darkened they are cut off from God's life because of their deep-seated ignorance which springs from the fact that their hearts are hard they have lost all moral sensitivity and have given themselves over to whatever takes their fancy they go off greedily after every kind of uncleanness that's not us that's not us and so uh, the the point is again uh, that we need to to see how all this fits together now at the bottom of your notes then I want to kind of conclude with this um, the conclusion again it is critically important that we get in our heads that what we are, that what we are doing is first of all thoroughly biblical I hope you understand that what we're working through here though we're again we're using the help of of a person who has you know done a lot of work to help us all think about this this is a thoroughly biblical thing that we're talking about the methodology that we're doing is thoroughly biblical it's important that you understand that for you to because if you don't then you're going to you're going to hold back you're not going to give yourself to it completely like you will need to and then secondly it's thoroughly revel, re, re, relevant, relevant for us today just as it was for them this is not something that was just simply true in the first century and now you know 2,000 years later it has no application it has the same application uh, here and now as it did back 2,000 years ago and then uh, also it is thoroughly needed for you and I to be prepared for the next destination we need to understand I think it to me it's helpful to know where God is leading me in a general sense okay I know uh, I know the map I have a map of it that's what we're looking at is the map now I still have a lot of traveling to do and probably you do too but we know where we're headed we're headed in preparing our minds and and looking at the the disciplines the habits that we're gonna start digging into in, in a couple of weeks of heart and mind and will that are going to enable us to to get to the place where this becomes more of what we might say natural or you know it just happens from us it flows from us more freely okay questions oh I'm sorry the first one was Colossians the second one was Ephesians yeah good you know it's weird I I get so excited sometimes I forget to tell you what goes in the blanks. So that's okay. I can't even lay the top. No, no, you're all good. Other questions? Next week we're gonna we I want you to you probably have already read this. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't, go ahead and read it. Pages one seventy two to one seventy nine. It's it's section seven in our book, chapter five. And we're gonna be looking at uh, one more one more week we're going to be looking at other scriptural passages from the Apostle Paul that uh, we're going to be looking in the in the Corinthians and Thessalonians to kind of to not only see the same pattern but what we're going to see in the book of of uh, first Corinthians is we're going to start launching we're going to discover a truth there next week that uh, is, a, is a really is really a point that that you do need to think about I'm not going to spoil it and tell you what it is but there's something that we're going to start as we move on forward that's going to take us to uh, to the place where we need to go to start thinking uh, in the right ways so buddy else okay 
I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. I have not got my act together. I was going to ask you a question and have you put it in cards, and then I don't have the cards here with me. They're in my office. And Anyway, here's a question I'd like for you to think about, okay? Besides Jesus, who is your favorite Bible character or person? Okay, and if you're watching online, I would like to know that, and I would love for you to answer that, okay? Those of you who would like, if you're online and would like to at some point answer that question, uh, I would love to, to hear that as well. But I'm, I'm curious as to uh, who that is, who's your favorite. So uh, sometime when we're talking, you, you know, I'd be happy to tell me that. I would, I would love to know that. And, uh, and also I'd be interested to know why. What is it that of all the people in the Bible, that one kind of got your, got your fancy? Okay? We're going to pray. Can you stand up with me and let's pray? Father, I just want to thank you tonight for the word. I want to thank you for uh, people like Paul, who, uh, while he is in prison many times and is writing and is going about the work that you gave him, he is with great skill and effort presenting your truths in ways that 2,000 years later we can we can still make sense of. Father, I pray that, that the books of the Bible like Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians and Corinthians and, and other letters that were written to, to Christ followers just like us would start to make more sense to us and would see the similarities and the, and the, the beautiful sections that they are uh, realizing that they are letters written to different churches who are dealing with different issues, but fundamentally they carry a similar message that is identifiable and patterns that are time-tested and true and powerful. Dear God, I just pray that you would help us to submit to that and realize that and do whatever it is that we need to do. Now that you've given us this wonderful salvation to take the next steps that we need to, and that is to be more uh, fully formed so that our, our life is a mirror, is a reflection of our heart. Help us as we do that and bless us as we go forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Wayne Wade. I see you. Wayne Wade's in the house tonight. Your wife's not paying attention. She's here, but she's not paying attention. Anyway, I like Paul, too. He's pretty cool. Anyway, good to see you. Uh, love you all on, online tonight, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.